The December 16th, 2020 City Council meeting to order. Uh, would everyone please stand and join, join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With the, uh, with the council chambers being, having some renovations going on, we've had to make some changes and I'm not sure everyone can hear me. Okay, we get kind of a, an echo in here. So. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and consent agenda. Mayor Whitney, roll call please. Oh, excuse me. Will the clerk please call the roll? Thank you. Councilmember Chilson? Present. Lisa Parker? Uh-huh. Hutchings? Councilmember Hutchings? Unmute. Oh, I see him there. Councilmember Ruffridge? Here. Pamela Parker? Here. Carrie? Present. And Student Representative Cox. Here. And I will note for the record that Ms. Hutchings is in attendance through Zoom, however, has not unmuted yet. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of agenda and consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda and consent agenda? Mayor, I would move that we approve the Agenda and agenda. Thank you, Mr. Ruffridge. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Are there any changes to the agenda or consent agenda? Would the clerk please read the consent agenda? Approval of the December 2nd, 2020 Council Meeting Minutes. New Business Ordinances. Ordinances for Introduction. Ordinance 2020-29, amending Soldatna Municipal Code, Title II, Chapter 4, City Council, by enacting a new subchapter 15 titled Meeting Time Restrictions, Uncomplete Agenda, and amending subchapter 30, paragraph A, to include a place on the agenda for uncompleted agenda items. Introduced by Councilmember Lisa Parker, public hearing on January 13, 2021. Ordinance 2020-30, Amending Soldatney Municipal Code, Title II, Chapter 4, City Council, enacting a new subchapter 35 titled Defeated Legislation Reintroduction, introduced by Lisa Parker, public hearing on January 13, 2021, and Ordinance 2020-31, further suspending restrictions on council attendance by teleconference, as established in Soldatney Municipal Code 2.04.010D. Introduced by Lisa Parker, Councilmember Lisa Parker, public hearing on January 13, 2021. New Business Action Memorandum 2020-29, Mayoral Appointments to Advisory Boards and Commissions. Appointments to the Airport and Commission include Charlene Totfest, Alexander Bias, and Kurt Olson. Appointments to the Library Advisory Board include Mary Lou Myers and Edward Von Brayman. Appointments to the Park and Recreation Advisory Board include James Delker, Eric Cugarte, Annette Villa. And appointments to the Planning and Zoning Commission include Eric Cugarte, Caitlin Bodla, Mark Burton, and David Blossom. And that is your consent agenda. Are there any public comments on any of the items just read read by the clerk? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star 9 on your telephone. I see one hand ran, Cassie Rankin. Please go ahead. 
could dismiss the district for H, and I was just uh, ascertaining that we're on the agenda tonight in the resolution. This is the time for items that are on the consent agenda. Uh, the item about 4-H will be a little bit later on. Perfect. Thank you. I see no other hands raised. Uh, Mr. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. just wanted to comment on a very nice list of uh, people interested in applying to be on the different boards and commissions. You made good choices, and it was really nice to see such a thorough list of people wanting to serve the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Are there any council objections to approving the agenda and consent agenda? Hearing none, the agenda and consent agenda are approved. Moving on to item number four, public comments and presentations. Uh, are there any members from the public who would like to speak on any, any item not appearing on the agenda? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. Uh, you're limited to three minutes, and please state your name and address for the record. I see no hands raised, so we will close this part of the agenda and move on to item number five. Are there any representatives from the borough or the state in attendance who would like to speak? I believe I saw Mr. Tyson Cox. I see no one, so we will move on to the item number six on the agenda. Now, public hearings, testimony limited to three minutes per speaker, and we have none tonight. Uh, moving on to new business, we have Resolution 2020-061, approving a multi-year reservation and waiving facility rental fields at the Soldotna Regional Sports Complex for the 2021 and 2022 Kenai Peninsula 4-H Ag Expo, uh, introduced by City Manager. May I have a motion Move to adopt? adopt in resolution 2020-061. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a, a potential project that's been in the works for some time. I know Andy Connick and Joel Todd have been in discussions with um, our local 4-H club about the potential of relocating some activity to Sylvania in the Peanut Peninsula there in August. And in the packages of requests that would allow the city to waive the fees for two years, uh, so for the summer of 2021 and 2022, for them to be able to relocate the Ag Expo to the rodeo ground and the sports center. It would be a, a very large event encompassing all of those facilities, um, several days. And there's a memo in the packet from Mr. Carmichael as well as from Ms. Rankin with the 4-H club detailing all the different events that would be associated with with that um, transition of those activities to full body. Uh, the council has previously approved the standard fee schedule, and that's what we use to um, apply rental rates to those different facilities. And the council also has the option of um, asking to waive those fees, and this is what the request is brought before you tonight. It would be essentially a two-year waiver of fees to allow this organization to uh, make the transition with the hope that it becomes a permanent fixture in uh, August here in the Central Connect Central area. And I do know we've got Mr. Carmichael with us from our, our team as well as a couple of representatives from the local 4 H club that are available as well. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak uh, on this item? 
for those participating through Zoom, and I'll stall here for a second. I saw Miss Parker had her hand up. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, I would like to declare a possible conflict with Resolution 2020-061, as I'm a member of the University of Alaska Board of Regents, and 4-H Expo is being assisted by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Cooperative Extension Service. So I leave it up to you, Mayor Whitney, if I do have a conflict or not. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, after reviewing this and taking a look at the uh, city municipal code and speaking with the city attorney, uh, conflict does not exist as Council Member Parker has no substantial financial interest as defined in Soldat Municipal Code 2.24.030. Um, again, I'm going to mention uh, we're in a different location for the regular meeting and I'm getting a lot of feedback so it sounds like I'm talking twice so I may stop and have to start over again so um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item for those participating through zoom please raise your hand if you would like to comment app users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star 9 on your telephone I see uh, Cassie Rankin has her hand raised. Uh, please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. Hi there. I, my name is Cassie Rankin. I'm with the United Peninsula District 4-H. With me is Maya Lando. She's our 4-H District Council President. She's also 4-H alumna and a longtime dedicated volunteer. I've been a 4-H mom and volunteer for over a decade, and for the past four years I've been on staff with the University of Alaska Fairbanks as a coordinator. Uh, we do thank you for the warm welcome. We love working with the city to date. We treasure your consideration of supporting 4-H in this event. This, um, like Ms. Stephanie said, this event has been in discussion for um, at least a decade uh, as our program um, has grown over the years. We enjoy a very long history and heritage with our local care, but the distance can sometimes be a deterrent for folks who might otherwise want to uh, participate in our programs. We have long pondered a, centrally, a more centrally located um, event for our families and for our community. Uh, this year, <laughs> our youth, we like to think that they always think outside the box, but this year especially, they had to really think outside the box. And we ended up hosting our livestock auction at the Soldado Rodeo Grounds instead of having to do it digitally like so many of the other 4-H programs across the country. Hosting that event there, it brought full circle those years long discussions uh, about the expo and it cemented for our families, our youth, and our board that we really needed to get the ball rolling on bringing this event to the Central Peninsula. Even though we were uh, we had a global pandemic, our programs were half the size this year, uh, and we had this flat together hybrid event, we still saw a huge showing in our community for our 4-H youth. Not only did our bidders show up for our auction, they made it one of the most enthusiastic and financially profitable ones that the kids have ever had. We like to, um, as we envision this expo, we look at it as a way to share that enthusiasm and build on it. We're modeling the expo after the home show, not just as the auction, however, but instead a weekend to showcase all things agriculture while shining the light on the project, creativity, and expertise of our 42. We're super excited to see involvement from all areas of the act community. We envision local vendors, food trucks, feed stores, farmers market type groups, and of course, our cooperative extension agent. Um, <clears throat> our event will have live talk shows, sports shows, exhibits, programs by our 4-Hers, educational workshops, and of course, the auction. We see this as a huge potential to positively impact our community economically, agriculturally, and, relations, and relationally. We see it as a potential to bring in thousands of people over the course of one weekend, all while fostering positive community relations while educating our guests on sustainability and self-reliance. We rely on fundraising, the occasional small grant, and a tiny, tiny program manager to deliver solid youth programs. I am super, super proud of our board and how they steward their finances so well. Uh, but this expo, it will have many startup costs, as you can imagine, advertising, printing, 
uh, the largest expense being panels, pens, and fences that will look professional, as well as keeping our animals and our guests safe. We appreciate the consideration of waiving the rental fees these first two years as we work hard to make this an event that 4-H, you, and our community will be proud of. Thanks again for having us. Thank you. Are there any council questions? Uh, Mr. Carey? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On uh, to the speaker. Will there be any savings uh, by the 4-H group itself? I know that the, we're talking about the fee for the sports center, but are there other ways in which this will actually uh, be less expensive for the group? Well, for our for our group, um, I can't say that there will be a huge savings for our, our district funds. We have our district council as well as our junior market life tech board. But for our family, we see an average of 50 families that have to uh, pack up their homes, their farms, and they go down to the fairgrounds and they camp there. Which, you know, with, with small children, with animals, that can be an expense. Uh, so it will be a huge savings to our families for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the service you guys provide. Thank you. Ms. Hutchings? Thank you, Mayor Whitney. I was just wanting to say that, you know, this came before Parks and Rec and our Zoom wasn't working, so we were not able to give our recommendation for this. I think this is an excellent opportunity for the city of Soldotna to have this in our area. I think it will also make a lot more money for 4-H because we're centrally located and people will be more inclined to participate instead of having always to drive to Ninochek. Not that I have anything against a new chick, but I mean, it, it is, you have to really think about it. It can't be a spur of the moment issue. So I hope that we will approve this. Any other questions? Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, just a matter of curiosity. Um, uh, how large is the district for 4-H uh, for the pencil? What area does it encompass? So actually, our district is uh, geographically, we're the size of Vermont. Uh, we cover, um, from, we have clubs right now, we have seven active clubs from Seward to Sterling to Homer, our, um, and several in Nikiski. Um, but our geographical area, we spread over to Tionic, Seldovia, um, you know, as far north as, as Hope. And um, so it's a very large district. COVID, our, our goals with, uh, before COVID came along and kind of just slowed everything down. We're in a, I wouldn't say a holding pattern right now, but we're in a, okay, let's just maintain and wait this out for a little while. And, you know, we're delivering all of our programs digitally online. Um, but the goal was to start expanding through the school district, our, um, our clubs and our programs. So really the, the potential for this to be a, a large thing is there. Um, over the last four years, just in our market program alone, we've seen um, in 2017, that was my first fair, we had 21 youth auction. Um, and this year, when we started 2020, we had 52. And so each year we've seen exponential growth um, by about 10 to 12 youth. And, um, you know, in, in every family that we have in this community that's involved in agriculture, you, know, you can imagine the ways that that kind of spider webs and forms a strong agriculture community. So we look forward to growing again. Like I said, we're, we're pretty slow this year. We lost quite a few kids, um, not, you know, out of, out of any negative thing other than this pandemic that just forced a lot of families to have to reconsider their priorities. But we'll, we'll bounce back from it and we're excited to do so. Any other council questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your uh, comments, Ms. Rankin. And next I see, um, and I'm going to mangle this name, uh, Maya Liam. Hi, my name is Maya Lale. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the council for considering this. A lot of our 4-H operating budget comes from fundraisers. We're currently doing a big sale. So as you can imagine, this will really help us out with getting this event kicked off. I think it has a lot of opportunity to benefit the community and benefit the kids, which is what I really care about. Are there any questions from the council? Seeing none, thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this? <coughs> 
I see no one with a raised hand. Uh, having no one else who wishes to speak, the item is back before the council. Are there any council comments? Seeing none, uh, I'd just like to comment. I, I see this as a win-win situation. Uh, situation for the city and the 4-H and I uh, hope this continues on for many many years. And call for the vote please. Councilmember Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Student Representative Cox? Yes. You have six yes votes. Thank you. Uh, the resolution passes by a 6-0 vote. Uh, next item on the agenda is resolution 2020-062, further extending the disaster emergency declared for the city of Soldatna in response to the COVID-19 pandemic introduced by the city manager. May I have a motion to adopt? I'll make a motion to adopt. Thank you, Ms. Hutchings. May I have a second? second? I say I'll second that. I don't know if anyone else is trying to at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the council may recall, that the disaster de declaration that I had first issued back in March has been extended uh, several times by the council, and most recently just through the end of December. Uh, so we're coming up on that uh, termination of the existing declaration, and the council has an opportunity to decide whether to further, further extend it. I've provided a memo in the packet that outlines what I see as some of the critical considerations in terms of continuing to support us at the administration in our response and recovery efforts. Um, particular, particularly around um, being able to have a little bit of flexibility regarding um, some of the processes we employ, whether it's uh, with our own personnel or how we administer contracts and things. This additional executive authority that was granted in our Sylvana version of the disaster declaration is something that I haven't used very often, but it, it has been critical and very important to us when, when it was used to allow us to respond uh, quickly. And I gave essentially the examples of how that's been used in the past. As you know, we're, um, I think it feels to me a bit like a transition in terms of how we're responding and what we're focusing on. Uh, we're focusing as the staff a lot on communications and, and sharing good information based on the feedback we got recently from the council about the, uh, the priority that that is for our council, um, as well as starting to engage in conversations about logistics and community planning for vaccine distribution. So we're continuing to be uh, very much engaged in a lot of different efforts in terms of responding, um, planning for recovery, and would seek the council's consideration of this 90-day extension. Um, many of the cities on the peninsula were on a similar timeline as we are in that their disaster declarations were set to expire essentially around the end of this year, just like ours was. I know that the borough assembly had a meeting, a uh, special meeting earlier this week where they uh, extended their disaster declaration through March and we're asking for some more consideration for the city of Slovakia. Thank you. Are there any questions? I do have one. Um, what would be the consequences of not extending? So some of the consequences of not extending um, in the executive authority, um, it would be slower to respond in some instances. So where we've been able to um, maybe modify existing grant agreements to extend deadlines um, or waive certain small provisions of the code to bring hire new people, bring people on to help with certain projects. I did that with our uh, CARES Act coordinator earlier this summer. Um, we would still be able to address those needs, but they would have to align with city council meetings, presumably, if it wasn't something that I felt I could address under the disaster declaration. So we would be slightly less um, nimble in terms of responding as a staff. Um, technically, our um, emergency operations center, which uh, for Soldat has really just been several of us wearing many hats, uh, it would no longer effectively be enforced. So our disaster um, response plan 
gets engaged when there's a local disaster declaration, and if that were to expire, um, it may be it may signify that really the council's intent was for us to spend less resources in that framework where we're um, kind of serving as a, a local emergency operations center within our city. Um, there may be a potential to have challenges with federal funding, although that wasn't an issue at the beginning. Um, when we first issued our disaster declaration, the state had their statewide disaster declaration in place. And so we would have been eligible to access federal uh, emergency funds under the umbrella of that state declaration. Um, that may change moving forward if at some point the state lets their disaster declaration expire. But it had recently been extended uh, by the governor and if it's extended again, we will still be able to access funding under that umbrella, but it could come a time where the state no longer has a disaster declaration in place, and if the city did not have a local one, we may be ineligible for those federal funds. So it hasn't been an issue today, just one other consideration. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star 9 on your telephone. I see no hands raised. So we'll bring it back to the console. Are there any console comments? Mr. Chilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so in the attached memorandum to this uh, ordinance, there's a, uh, a section where you're talking about examples where the authority has been used, granted through this uh, declaration, and one of them being the relaxation of the image uh, protocols, uh, which we implemented for this year. So is your intent if we pass this to continue that easement uh, through the end of this declaration? Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Chilson. That's a great example of a, something that exists in code that early on uh, we felt didn't make sense and, and to continue doing that. So our intent, we have not revisited when we would start resuming uh, potentially those penalties or fees. Certainly it doesn't make sense to me for the city to be even thinking about shutting off water during this public health crisis. Um, so I would hope that even if the disaster declaration expired, there may be examples like that where we would want to come to the council and, and seek your approval or, or your consideration for continuing on with some of the things that were put in place under the declaration. Okay, so that's not something that I'd like to see go away. So should this, if, if this ordinance were to fail, there is kind of a grace window where you'd be able to come back to council and we can discuss the continuation of that. We're not just gonna immediately start enforcing those fees if this doesn't pass tonight, is that correct? It would be correct, thank, uh, thank you to the mayor and Mr. Chilson. It would be correct uh, that we would not in, immediately start enforcing those, but we would uh, probably spend some time doing some cleanup and, and coming back to the council if there were any code provisions that essentially would be uh, back in place that I don't have the authority to waive any longer, we would be bringing those to the council uh, for the council to be able to give us direction on whether to continue on the path we're on or, or do some, something different. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, uh, we'll call for the vote. Council Member Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Student Representative Cox. Yes. You have six yes votes. Uh, resolution 2020-062 uh, passed with 6-0. The next item on the agenda is the Soldatna Regional Center Sports Complex Facility Status Update and Discussion. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we put this uh, agenda item, we advertised it as an update and discussion, and then subsequent to publishing that, really wanted to provide the council opportunity to uh, weigh in on some of the more particular proposals that we've got in front of you. Um, 
Um, I'll try and give just kind of a brief recap of where we're at, but if you'll recall, back in September uh, was when we presented uh, the first version of a facility operating plan for ICE activities to the Council. And really that was um, put together over the late summer in anticipation of ICE activities resuming and in working with our Parks and Rec Director uh, had come up with some facility protocols that we thought would make sense. Um, so we presented those in September and then we're really kind of operating under that protocol through October all the way up until early November. And that's when the, the governor had, there's been a really significant rise in cases statewide as well as in our community. He put out the request that Alaskans do more to everything they could to limit the spread. And in response to that, we closed the facility. So it's been closed for over a month now. And during that time, uh, our Parks and Rec Director, Andrew Carmichael, Joel Todd, our Assistant Parks and Rec Director, has been working very hard to do more research, understand what uh, ice rinks around the state are doing, how people are balancing the risk of COVID with uh, the goal of getting uh, youth activities in particular, getting kids back on the ice. Um, and what he's proposed, what I support and is in your packet is a set of revised protocols. It's more stringent than what we were operating under in October. And one reason for that is that back in October, um, it's hard to remember, but our kids were actually starting out in school. We were, we were in the orange kind of medium risk in terms of community transmission. And since then, we've crossed into the red and really our numbers continue to go pretty high. At one point, I think our central community uh, Central Peninsula is about 140 cases per 100,000, where 10 per 100,000 is that red high risk. So uh, we've got numbers that were pretty high up there, and now um, we're about half that. So it's great that they're coming back down. But really, we're responding to the level of um, spread in the community, recognizing that it's higher now than it had been previously. Um, and consulting the guidance from both the Centers for Disease Control as it relates to youth sports specifically, as well as a more recent document that was shared a couple weeks ago um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they issued a report specific to uh, reopening youth sports. And those two uh, resources, those two documents, essentially um, were very helpful for us in crafting these recommendations and these guidance. Um, and I'd like to ask Andrew Carmichael to speak uh, to some of the specific recommendations <coughs> as well as share his perspective and, and knowledge about what other rinks around the state are currently doing. Thanks, Andrew. As diverse as Alaska is, in some degrees, uh, right now, the, the openings and such for the rinks are as, depends upon the community. Uh, the Anchorage under the, in Anchorage, under the municipality of Anchorage's um, current procedures and mandates, there are no, that all players, Anybody entering the facilities must wear masks, including on the ice. No spectators are allowed. The parents are to drop the kids off dressed and enter to it. And then the, uh, as far as that's that's the standard as far as within that anchorage rim. There's limit on the ice of 30 per people on the ice for various activities. And then again, no spectators. If you step out to the valley, the Curtis Menard Center is closed has been closed since the same time as, as this as the Salatin Regional Sports Center closed. The Brett Memorial, which is operated by the borough, the Matsu borough, is no masks on the ice, masks in the facilities, social distancing, and a limit of two, two spectators per player. So they're essentially pretty fairly wide open. The rink in Palmer, which is operated by the city of Palmer, is synonymous in terms of its approach as the Brett Memorial is in the borough. Step down to Treadwell Arena in Juneau. Treadwell Arena is having practices, 45 minutes between practices, masks required to enter the facility, required to be on the ice. No more than 30 people, spectators on the ice, no more than 50 in the entire building. What we're proposing is kind of a, a collection of those. The Is the mask on the ice, masks in the building, no spectators. The we have a of allowed for the U6 and U8 year olds parents to come into the rink with them, help those smaller kids, make sure they get in the front door, make sure they get on the ice, and then have them vacate and then return at the end of the at the end of the 
practice session. We're asking the youth organizations to administer a COVID trace tracing program whereby they will have a representative present to screen the players and or people that come in with the COVID questions and then also record who has been in the building <coughs> in terms of if and there was a connection associate trace back. So my child played hockey, okay, he was on his hockey team, whether things were in there. We're proposing no games just and non-checking drills to get the kids on the ice in terms of those things. And about with regular ice times in terms of that, we're proposing a 25 person limit on the free, during the freestyle skating times. That's even though that's lower than hockey, that actually is our standard allowance during the freestyle figure skating practice sessions of 25. So that 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 there's no change other than no spectators. And in terms of those things, we're not planning on beginning restarting or learn to skate or public skate at these times. We have been working to provide some alternatives such as our our play working with the school district to get the Soldotna Elementary flooded for opportunities there, as well as the path of Soldotna Creek in terms of those. So, is it restrictive? Yes, it very, it very well is. I'll be honest, when we put this together, we went restrictive, conservative, and then have brought it to the council to see where we may be too restrictive and see what the council is hearing from the people. We hear, from, we hear from a very focused group of people, obviously, maybe a little more focused than y'all may, may hear, but we're trying to get interest as far as the feel for the community and see what the communities with which they're comfortable and then go from there. So at this point, um, this, is, this, is, this is stricture, this is, this is, this is a tight one. Um, and speaking with KPHA representatives as well as Hockey Club Alaska representatives, we have another meeting with them tomorrow. You know, the, they, they did express some some um, frustration at this, and um, and and it was it was well taken. It wasn't it wasn't blown off. It was accepted. And to which the, I'll be honest, part of the administration's first priority is figuring out a way that we can get these kids on the ice again in as safe a manner as possible. There's a, a great variance as as going on as since we've closed the building, Minnesota rinks have really tightened down to where the NAHL is shut down. Uh, Wisconsin rinks have done the same. There have been closures, full state closures around the country in various areas, including Michigan and Massachusetts and New York, where with, and all have different variations of this type of practice, that type of practice, and in terms of those things. So it just depends upon the community's personality and what, and, and numbers. And the, the really the only metric we have when we closed the facility was the metrics in place at time in terms of the, the caseloads. At that time, Soldotna was the second highest in the state, only behind Delta. Or not Soldotna, but yeah, Soldotna. So just trying to balance it and seeing what the code to it what, and, and now bring it for you, you guys' thoughts and um, considerations and approval, hopefully, one way or the other, modified or otherwise. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and I've just got one quick thing to add, and then we'll conclude our report. Um, Andrew did some research on um, hockey-specific masks. He found that CCM makes uh, masks, the game on masks, that attach right to a, a child's um, helmet and face guard, and it would make it easier for them to kind of take the sides off, flip the mask up. Um, we heard from someone who said it might be a little more comfortable for the athletes because it holds the mask a little bit away from their face, a little bit of the face. And so with our grant funds, we ordered 350 of those masks, most of them are already here. We're going to make them available to any players, coaches, officials um, who need them. If we need to get more, we can get more. But we're trying to offer um, ways to support uh, the hockey community and their families through this as well, um, knowing that that is, in our discussions, one of, one of the most challenging pieces of this proposal from their aspect. And it, and it makes sense that they would key in on that um, aspect because um, although the CDC and American Association of Pediatrics um, recommend masks for everyone over two years of age, even playing sports, um, hockey wasn't one of the sports that they need an exemption for. Things like swimming and tumbling and gymnastics were, but hockey wasn't one of the exemptions we saw. Um, we do know that masks are intended for people only who can take it off by themselves, and some parents express concern about a mask that goes behind the ears and then the helmet being on, whether they're, especially young children, would be able to wear that properly. So uh, we're hopeful that, you know, by offering these 
hockey-specific hockey masks, that that might alleviate some of that concern. But I just wanted to mention that that's one other thing that we explored that's available for folks, regardless of uh, kind of the facility tools that put in place and still make those available to folks. And I think with that, we'll conclude our report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there any questions from the council? Mr. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Carmichael, do you have any specific thresholds that you're looking for uh, in, decision, in making decisions to open things up more? And so what I'm interested in, and I want to say, I think you guys are doing a very good job, very difficult as an ex-coach. Um, so what needs to happen so that there could be some changes toward more involvement, maybe even games and that type of thing, matches that you can say? I get, I get questioned about that all the time, speaking with Kyle McFall from SOHI today about, you know, he called with an inquiry uh, right now, ASAA is scheduled to begin their play for high school hockey on January 4th. The United Peninsula Borough School District has not provided a direction or an allowance for that. The only metrics that, that seem to be indic indicative is the rate per 100,000 that puts us in the red, yellow, or orange. Where that threshold is, is not something that I'm prepared or capable of um, providing a, 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 an educated opinion on. Um, the, when we closed the facility, we were looking at a 21-team tournament from around the state. And the governor had just issued, uh, a, hey folks, we're in deep trouble, uh, press release that morning. And then that created an algorithm for us to look at that said, if the governor says the case numbers are high, if our numbers are second highest in the state, then do you continue to operate as usual, or is it then you close? In our case, it was governor says we're in deep, we're in deep trouble, pandemic is rising, and then the algorithm cannot not be invite 21 teams <laughs> into our area. But, or bring them all together, having the state having experienced two tournaments prior that did result in some things. So there isn't necessarily a number with which we look at, other than as an administrative a whole, working with the city manager, Queen, and touching base with some of the user groups and, and some of that stuff, just to figure out what we can look at and, and then be able to look the community in the eye and say, I'm confident with this decision. Um, that's why this is so restrictive uh, in, in, in its presentation because essentially we're bringing it to the council to see um, a kind of way to have the community say yay or no, or pull item B out or put item C in, to get a read from the community to see where they're comfortable. Mr. Carey, you have very comfortable with the decisions you're making. Ms. Pamela Parker. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. And I just um, have a question about um, procedure for this, since it is just a status update and discussion, will there be time for public comment or is this an appropriate time to make recommendations on changes to the reopening plan? This is just a council discussion. At the... So are you saying appropriate time to make recommendations for changing the plan? Uh, let's wait and see and let everyone have their questions. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Lisa Parker. Uh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, this is a question for either Mrs. Queen or Mr. Carmichael. Um, you mentioned Anchorage is requiring masks for everybody and the kids be dropped off. Do you know the ages of the kids' groups that are playing in Anchorage? And is it the same mix like we have here? All ages. All ages from youth down to or from U, U6 all the way up, the men's leagues are, aren't playing because they're games. There's been some talk that says, okay, we can practice, right? Oh, that's a 10 person per team practice, but that loop hasn't been exercised. They have had some allowances, which is, they allow certain flexibilities with the smaller groups, U, U6, U8, similar to what we put in our plan, they just kind of unofficially allow parents to bring, bring the six year old in, get him, get him or her dressed put them on the ice and then step out. So it's all groups, all age groups. Okay, thank you. And um, did, did I hear you say you're setting up uh, hockey rinks at Park Lake? 
and then over at Soldat Night Alley, you'll get that flood for skating also. We have two areas cleared at Arc Lake. In fact, one team rented a light plant last week and had one of their practices out at Arc Lake, and it was amazing to see. And then we have the family skate day, so, and then we're filling up the, working with the school district to, to get the user memorandum of agreement together, finish up, and start flooding it as well, yes. So, can I have one more, Mayor Whitney? Um, Mrs. Queen, would it be something where it would be feasible for the city to rent the lighting for Arc Lake so that the hockey associations would have to do that? Thank you, Mrs. Parker, to the mayor. That's an excellent idea, and um, Andrew and I talked about that the same day we found out that that coach had done that. And we are intending, if we haven't already, Andrew, to either rent or purchase light plants. Uh, they'll be grant funded that we can use right now out on the ice as well as in perpetuity moving forward in outdoor events. Any further questions from the, from the council? Uh, Mr. Ruffert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in our previous um, sort of iteration of the sports center policies, um, in your sort of experiences, um, I guess, for, for Andrew, um, as case counts were rising, did we see or were we at all aware of um, the sports center being a, a problem um, or the events that were occurring at the sports center? Because um, we had a pretty uh, good mitigation plan in place you know, in September. Uh, just a, a sense of as cases were rising, were we seeing, you know, any any evidence that they were rising sort of in that group that would be utilizing the sports center uh, to any uh, high, high degree or, or at all? Based upon our knowledge, we were just going with a community, a community numbers approach with relation to hockey specific. There was a tournament, the uh, Termination Dust Tournament, that um, actually made national news because of some COVID traces that were attracted back to it. But the, there was also another tournament prior to that. So we looked at hockey across the state as saying, okay, um, there's been two tournaments where two organizations and hockey numbers where there were traceable back to that. So that was a little bit of a, a, a broad, we didn't learn that until after the fact. But then we just looked at the overall community numbers and, and I would I'd be lying if I didn't say that the school district's um, measures to close school didn't, uh, weren't, weren't factored in as well as as a larger group as the same customer body and the students and the kids in terms of that. So as a community, things were the it, the the spike was going up, and um, that was what predicated the decision a month or so ago. Do I have a follow up, Mr. Rufford? Um Well, I guess I just maybe trying to get a sense of whether or not, you know, uh, the Parks and Rec crew and, and administration felt like our our plans from September going into, you know, our, our spikes. I mean, I, I understand the decision to close the sports center, uh, but do we have an idea or a sense that, you know, our, our plan or our mitigation protocol, you know, was doing its job um, initially? Um, is, is I guess my question, uh, like just more of a uh, yeah it was or no we had some concerns. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll try and answer Mr. Eckert's question. Um, one thing is uh, we would really never know. We would never be told whether, uh, from a public health standpoint, cases originated in the facility. It's just not information we have access to. And I don't think that we had kind of the communication network set up to have been able to have gleaned that information directly from the organization. So one of the things that's new in this current proposal is essentially a, an ask that they uh, have an a organization representative, whether it's a parent or a volunteer, available at every practice, checking students in, um, kind of running through a, a version of a health screening, kind of helping reinforce some of the facility rules, but then also really keeping good um, information about who's, who's playing, which teams are on the ice at the same time, so that if there were to be an exposure, we would we would hope moving forward we would have a much better communication system in, 
in place that we would be made aware of that. Um, so we're not aware of anything that happened prior, but I don't know that we should have expected to have been aware. Uh, we really didn't have a framework like that in place. Um, really, as Andrew and Mr. Carmichael pointed out, we're looking at just kind of the generalized recommendations about sports, specifically about hockey, and then trying to put in place layers of recommendations that reduce the risk, not necessarily make it go completely away. So that was kind of our approach, recognizing um, but I think that the situation in the community warranted us to bring back uh, a proposal with more more strict um, standards than previously uh, that were in place in September and October. Are there any further council council? I do have a couple. Are any of the of facilities statewide allowing games? with spectators. To my knowledge, the Brett Memorial is allowing games with reduced spectators to spectators for per player, and that's the same as the Palmer Ring. Those are the two. Fairbanks is only allows 20 people on the ice, and um, I don't believe games are up there other than in terms of their stuff. Everything in Anchorage and um, and everywhere else is um, practices only. Then what about Facebook their out, outdoor rink? Outdoor rinks, there was a blip, actually kind of a knee-jerk reaction up in Fairbanks where they closed their outdoor rinks for a couple days, and that was due to a communication um, snafu more than, than direct intent. So... As far as there, none of the outdoor facilities that I know of are um, are closed. In fact, and speaking some of them, my connections in Anchorage, one sent back. They all indoor. You know, the, the, the mask requirements, no spectators, are applicable to all indoor ice rinks. There was no reference to the outdoor ice rinks. And what about Kenai? Kenai is kind of a hybrid. It's pseudo outdoor, pseudo indoor. The team rooms are closed, and they are have some other protocols in place. And um, that's where KPHA has been doing the majority of their activities over there um, in terms of those things. And by, as far as I know, I think games are happening over there. Are there any other council questions or comments from the council? I know. Go ahead, Pamela. Is this the appropriate time? You're on. All right. Great. Okay, so um, I'm happy that we're considering this. I was appreciative of the administration closing down the sports center after the governor's request for community members um, to do everything they possibly could to help reduce the spread. But my thought is that if we're going to reopen it, we need to do it in a way that not only makes sense for families, but is also safe for our community. And I believe that some of the some of the bullet points outlined in the plan just do feel a little a little challenging for families to conform to. And I believe if we're going to reopen the sports center in a safe and effective way, we need to implement practices that are doable for our community and for our families, but that also will help to, to keep them safe. So based on the feedback that we received, I would like to make a couple of changes. And I'm going to be doing these in three separate motions. Just uh, Ms. Sainer said that would make it a little bit easier. And I will try to speak as slowly as possible when I make some of these motions. So I think it would be um, beneficial to have the plan uh, open so you can kind of see what I'm referencing. And since they're not numbered, A, B, lettered, etc. We're going to go with bullet point number whatever. Okay, so for the first one, um, I move to change bullet number one on the reopening plan uh, to remove even when on the ice and practicing. And for that first bullet point to read, all people entering the Solotner Regional Sports Center must wear masks at all times except when actively exercising as long as six feet of social distancing can be maintained. Is there a second? 
I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. <coughs> Discussion? Mr. Rufford? I, I was actually just going to see if uh, I missed maybe that last uh, section about the six feet. I was just going to see if the clerk could re repeat that or if maybe uh, Councilman Parker could repeat that. Uh, the wording is all people entering SRSC must wear masks at all times except when actively exercising as long as six feet of social distan distancing can be maintained. Anything else, Mr. Rufford? Um, I guess just a quick point of clarification. So that's referencing uh, if you're on the ice, um, if you can maintain six feet, you don't you don't have to mask. But if you can't, then then you should. I think I maybe I'm not saying that. Right. Yeah, I'd be happy to explain my thoughts on that. Um, so the intent is to kind of highlight the fact that we also have something further down in this plan that talks about um, practices only, no contact, and checking drills, or they should be limited to ensure social distancing. So if the teams are doing their absolute best to maintain that social distancing, obviously they're not going to be out there with pool noodles, making sure that they're six feet apart, but the idea is that they're intending to do that, then masks would not be needed while on the ice. Again, no one's going to be out there specifically measuring, but if the teams are doing their best to maintain that distance, then I believe that masks on the ice would not be necessary. Uh, Vice Mayor Parker. Um, if I might, to the city manager, uh, Mayor Whitney, didn't you just say that the city purchased 350 masks that were specifically made for hockey? Um, thank you, Ms. Parker. Through the mayor, that's correct. Um, Andrew found them in two different sizes, kind of a larger size and a smaller size, as well as ones that are specifically for goalies. So we have most of the masks on hand, and the ones that were, I think, close by were second anchorage should be here very soon. Follow-up? Any other questions from Mr. Carrick? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Mr. Carmichael, if uh, you wanted to. Andrew, with this particular thing, would this make it easier or harder for you and your staff? Um, no. Um, we, we're looking for direction. We make things happen. The one, the one question I would ask is with relation to the verbiage, my phone died for a second, is we have people exercising both on the rink and then we have walkers that, have, that will come in and seeking shelter away from the ice. So in terms of some of the language would need to be factored in, whether or not that was open, whether or not those masks, or what, how, would, how that would factor in. So we have two areas of, of where we look is, is either on the ice, which is one, pseudo finite area but then the lobby area and such like that that's not quite as finite and has some different nuances so um, well, that's the only other thing beyond that we're looking for assistance and we've got assurances from the organizations that we can make things happen and work in, in through there so it depends on what counts you know, as I noted this is a very stringent thing for which I would anticipate a little bit of a la carte action happening just like Councilwoman Parker is doing so that because you guys have more results on the community sometimes than we do. Thank you, sir. And I guess I have a uh, try to define ex exercising. Uh, knowing hockey plowing layers, uh, they're very rarely like, six feet apart. <laughs> uh, uh, there's going to be contact. They're going to be scrambling for a puck. Uh, there's going to be score goaling, and so it it almost sounds like um, 
they would have to wear a mask on ice pretty much the whole time done. You know, walking around the reek is exercise. Uh, being on the eye is practice, and practice is trying to get the puck away from somebody else and scoring. So, I'm just not sure what this is going to accomplish. Mr. Rufford. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess uh, just trying to formulate my thoughts just a little bit on this issue. Um, I, uh, I I guess I have concerns about uh, attempting to sort of micromanage, um, you know, the uh, the individual, you know, sort of persons on the ice, what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, I feel like our uh, our Parks and Rec crew and the administration put together a, a really solid plan back in September, um, and you know the mask situation certainly has become a divisive uh, one and one that uh, certainly creates a, a sense uh, of division in our community. Um, I I look at the masks that were provided um, by the city. I think they're great. I think they're a great option. In fact, if I had children playing hockey, I would actually uh, think they would be a, a, a fine option uh, for my, my child to wear. Um, however, I think it becomes a, a situation when we sort of put a, a big blanket over top of, uh, of everything and say everyone must do X, Y, Z. And it, puts, it maybe puts a burden on, on the city or city staff one way or the other you know, if we say no to masks, uh, potentially there is, you know, um, uh, a little bit of an easier road. If we say yes to masks, then there, there's a little bit of a enforcement potential there, whether that's on the hockey uh, administration groups or uh, the city administration as far as parks and rec. Um, I think that the I, I think that the masks that the city are providing is a helpful tool. Um, I, I don't know as though that that's a one size fits all. I think I would I would probably lean towards the the idea that everyone in that sports center uh, should be wearing masks upon entry, uh, and then uh, and then when engaged in sort of a, an ice event, um, you know whether that's hockey or some other sort of ice event, um, you know that masks would be encouraged, but. But um, you know, and, and provide all of the tools for people to use them, um, and I think that that should actually be true if we open up outdoor skating as well. I think hockey, as Mr. Carey and others are uh, very clear about, hockey is a cl close up and it's hard to be apart. And regardless of whether you're outside or in a giant hockey rink, you're going to be close to somebody. And just because you're outside doesn't mean it's all of a sudden a magic pill that COVID can't get you uh, or spread. Um, I don't know why all of a sudden it's like when you're outside, it's like all bets are off. I think we should maybe provide those masks to all the hockey organizations and say when you're outside, if you're at Art Lake, if you're playing, if you're in the sports center, we're providing you all the tools to be as safe and as healthy as possible. Um, and I think that that should be you know, something I would support, certainly. but. Um, I think I, I like the uh, motion on the on the floor that uh, Ms. Parker put forward. Um, I just want to make sure that it's clear enough to understand that masks are being worn in the building, but um, you know when when on the ice and engaged in in an ice event, you know that they may be removed if, if desired. But um, I think that seems clear. Sorry, that was. Any other comments? Ms. Coyne. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question um, maybe for Ms. Parker on the motion. I was curious whether your intent was that it applied to athletes as well as coaches, parent helpers, officials, potentially. Um, that's something we also saw in our um, kind of research, that there may be a distinction among 
whether the athletes in, the, in this case, the youth that are wearing masks while uh, practicing versus the adults that are on the ice. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you had any time one way or the other. Um, I should have had Council Member Ruffridge phrase it because he did a much better job than I did. Uh, but yes, just the intent was that the athletes on the ice when they're exercising, so not the parents that are helping, not the coaches, but the athletes would have that option to not wear a mask um, if they saw fit. I guess would be the probably the better way to phrase it. But yes, coaches, parents, helpers out on the ice, anyone in the building would be required to mask up. It would just be for those athletes, and that would be their choice at that point. Don't know if you'd like me to reword it. <laughs> Any other comments? I guess I'll interject another another one here. Um, I think this gets a little confusing. Um, I think people are going to try try and figure out if they're supposed to wear one or if they're not supposed to wear one. Uh, I would almost like to see us go back to to what it was before we closed and and go from there so no other comments uh, we'll call for a vote on that uh, original motion please call the roll council member chilson yes lisa parker no hutchings no ruffridge uh, yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carey? Mr. Carey, you're muted. Pardon me? No. Student Representative Cox? Yes. You have three yes votes and three no votes. And I have the tie breaker, and, and I will vote no. Miss Pamela Parker? All right. Um, so I'm going to move on to the second bullet point. So, again, this is somewhat of a long one, but I, actually, it's going to involve the second and third one, so just take a look at both of those. So I move to strike almost all of the second and third bullet point and it will just be consolidated into a second bullet point and it will read spectators are allowed but masks must be worn at all times and spectators must maintain six feet of distance when possible so spectators are allowed but masks must be worn at all times and spectators must maintain six feet of distance when possible and it would strike the rest of the language from bullet two and bullet three. Is there a second? I'll second. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chilson. So the motion on the floor right now is to strike bullet point number two and three and insert the new wording, spectators are allowed but must wear masks mask at all time and maintain six feet of distance when possible. So, uh, Ms. Parker? Um, so the reasoning behind this one is that a lot of the feedback we heard from the public was that dropping young children, even walking them in and then and dropping them was not feasible for some families, particularly if they're going to be required to wear masks while on the ice. So this would allow for spectators um, to be in the building. It didn't put a limit on spectators. If anyone else would like to uh, change that later on, feel free. Um, but this would just allow folks to come in, watch their kiddos practice, um, as long as they're wearing masks and maintaining distance when possible. We have a very large facility, and I believe that it's doable, especially with the practices being spaced out for families to come in and watch. And I think it puts a little bit of a burden on families when you have to have just one parent go in and drop a kiddo off with potentially other kids in the car, different practices all on the same day. I just, I think that this would be a much easier 
way to accommodate those safety rules while still being safe. Any council comments or discussion? Mr. Joseph. Um, I just say that I agree. You know, we have a very large facility. There's no reason that we can't allow the community to come back and to be involved in the hockey process. We have space. It's not a complicated rule. Wear a mask. You're welcome to come in and serve. So let's let our spectators back in. Just let them be there and be safe. Vice Mayor Parker. Um, thank you. This is a question for Mrs. Queen and Mr. Carmichael. Um, is the sports center currently set it up for social distancing like we see at the hospital or at the post office and stores around town which some people observe and some people don't? Uh, we have dots on the floor. We have chairs spread out. So you'll, it's similar to what you see in, in everywhere else in the, in the main traffic areas. We've incorporated the prior to taking the team rooms back offline. We incorporated the racquetball courts as additional areas so that teams could be spread into two or three locker rooms without running short. So there's a lot of mechanisms we can go to that. We've, we've done the pipe and drape thing before um, in order to segregate and kind of funnel people to one certain areas and away from other areas. And it worked with some success. Again, just like you said, some people love it. Some people um, absolutely hate it. And there's not, there's, and then there's a large, huge group in the middle that says, okay, whatever. So I'm going to do it. So. You have a follow up, Vice Mayor? Any other questions or comments from the con? Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, <laughs> I'm wondering if maybe, I feel like maybe the appropriate approach, um, uh, first I just want to say I, I support the concept of uh, spectators, uh, you know, being safe, social distancing, it's a huge building, all the things we already heard, um, almost um, kind of going down the path of maybe it would be uh, an easier process to, uh, you know, uh, discuss, you know, we can change all of these things in the current thing before us, or maybe we could, as a council, discuss, uh, you know, bringing back or, or talking about the previous um, sort of large sports center discussion that we had and the protocols that were in place there, and, and amending those, um, maybe with a few items, rather than sort of, you know, uh, uh, Change, changing all the things in, in the wording that's, that's in front of us, but um, I certainly I like the idea of having limited spectators, uh, parents allowed in the building. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's we've lived with COVID for nine months, and I mean, if you don't know what good good practices are to be a good neighbor by this point, uh, you you know, haven't paid attention. So, um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be supportive of that. Any further questions, discussion from the council? Uh, I have a concern with this. Uh, saying spectators are allowed in the building without setting a limit. With six feet uh, distancing, if I remember correctly, the um, Mr. Carmichael or and mentioned that that would be about 300, about 300 people. Um, so here again, I think if you're going to do anything, is go back to what it was before we shut it down. It was working at that time, and um, I think it can work again. So. Ms. Pamela Parker. I do understand that there might be some concern around not having a limit. I just think it would be, again, a challenge for families if we set that one person or two person spectator limit. Um, and if we can get folks spaced out six feet apart in the sports center and that means 300 people, that would also mean that each person on the ice would have to bring about five to six people with them to spectate a hockey practice for four year olds. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to see the one or two parents or one parent with two kids 
three kids. I don't think that we're going to see the sports center filled up for U6 and U8 hockey practice, um, but I do think this would just allow for more flexibility uh, for those families. I'll make a and comment on that. I apologize. Yeah, I'll make <laughs> a comment on that. The way uh, this has been worded, it does not apply to to under eight and under six. It applies to everyone. It sounds like the way this is written out, anyone, any hockey team, will be able to play or, or practice in the sports center, including high school hockey, if they get started again. Because of the, uh, the last motion that passed, it eliminated the wording under A and under 6. So it's, as I see this, it, it's opening it up for everyone. Mr. Chilson. Um, I do see that you're correct. It, there is no restriction on age, but again, one of the bullet points further down does still prohibit games and scrimmages. So I, I think just still focusing on practices only, I, I don't see the sports center filling up for even a high school hockey practice. It's, it's just hockey practice. I think we put more of a burden on the families having to count admissions in the building rather than just saying, you can come in, you can watch your kids play hockey, or play hockey for the practice rounds, just wear a mask, just keep it simple. And again, I, I just don't see the sports center filling up for a high school practice session. Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, to Mrs. Parker, uh, do you are you going to be proposing changing the on ice limits in a future motion? Not knowing what's coming in the future makes it difficult. Since you say you have, you're going to be addressing many of these, it makes it difficult to to vote on issues. Not knowing if we're going to make a decision that later on we're going to regret having made that decision because you increased the number of teams that can play and the number of people that can practice. So that, that makes it very difficult. That's a great point and I'm just happy to share that I only have one more motion after this and it is about the team rooms opening back up and that's the last one I'm going to make. I don't plan on making any other changes. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote on the motion. Councilmember Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? No. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Student Representative Cox. Yes. You have five yes votes. Uh, motion passed, five to one. Your next motion, Ms. Parker. All right, last one, y'all, I swear. Okay, so this is addressing bullet point four. Okay, so I move to strike the word not from bullet point four, and it would read Players shall come to the rink just to play. Team rooms will be open to players, coaches, and other adult helpers. All people entering the team rooms must wear masks at all times and maintain six feet of distance when possible. Is there a second? I'll Mr. Second, Chilson. Yeah. Mr. Chilson. Ms. Pamela Parker. Thank you. I can speak to this one as well. Um, so some of the feedback that we heard from parents um, was that they understood the reasoning behind closing the, the team rooms in an attempt to social distance, but then you have all the kiddos packed into the hallways prior to practice and that it actually just didn't really benefit uh, the, the social distancing aspect that you would be able to socially distance better if they were allowed access to the team rooms. And again, with masking and doing their best to maintain distance, I think that opening the team rooms would be a feasible thing for our families to 
Any council comments in district discussion? Vice Mayor Parker. Um, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, for Mrs. Queen or Mr. Carmichael, um, why did you include the team rooms would not be open as a recommendation? Uh, thank you, Ms. Parker and the Mayor. So, um, in terms of assessing risk of every single aspect of this, one of the suggestions of making practices lower risk is closing locker rooms, which is a smaller enclosed space, more difficult to um, maintain social distancing. Um, the statewide, I think, parent organization at some point had also issued a um, directive to all of the organizations that, that uh, team rooms would be closed unless they get a special exemption. And so the um, league actually went through a special process to submit the specific COVID plan for the Salatin Sports Center and Andrew's proposal to open up additional spaces and make them team rooms. They actually did get an, an exception. So um, it's a recommendation that's one more way to limit the risk in promoting social distancing, um, and that's why it was in there. And I would, uh, sorry if I could, Mr. Mayor, I would ask a follow-up question that the first line, I don't believe Ms. Parker's motion struck out the term players shall come dress to play. That seems to be in conflict with opening back up the team rooms because the reason that statement was in there was if the team rooms were going to be closed, then we would need to give um, a heads up to, to parents and players that they already come dress. I don't know if that was intended to be part of the motion or not. Thank you. Ms. Pamela Parker. Sure. Um, so I, I know that the expectation is that players come dressed, and I do believe that that should still be included. I also know reality is that that is not always going to be the case, and you're still going to have extra things that kids are putting on, kind of gathering in a waiting area, and still being very close to each other. So I believe that this would help to kind of combat that issue that was brought up about having the teams closed. Any other questions or discussion? Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, please, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Please remind us how many team rooms there are at the sports complex. We have four designated team rooms, but with uh, utilizing the conference rooms and the racquetball courts, as well as since the Brown Bears are out of town, that's an option, and the other two small locker rooms. We actually bumped that all the way up to um, nine in terms of total segregated spaces with some of the conference rooms being exceptionally large. So we have phenomenal social distancing capabilities for a team to come into various spaces. So that's, that's possible. We're fortunate. None of the other rinks, when we talk about that, um, don't hate us. We have so, many, so much space to work with that we can provide additional opportunities to probably to possibly get back opened up and, and interrupt as little interruption as possible. Ms. Hodgins. I was wondering if this is going to require additional cleaning requirements since we're going to be accessing more space. And I just have a real hard time. Kids don't socially distance very well. So I just personally don't see how this is going to work. If I may respond, Mayor? Go ahead. Um, it'll add a few minutes, depending upon the spaces, but each time a, a team comes through for practice, we usually end up touch point sanitizing two rooms that they've used in order to social distance. So opening back up doesn't, doesn't pose, even if they're bigger spaces, it'll add maybe 30 seconds, 40 seconds to the, to the equipment's time that we have to do that. So disinfection isn't a problem. The other thing, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a rodeo when you're hurting six-year-old cats. Ms. Pamela Parker. And for that piece of it, is, that's why I included um, that mask uh, must be worn because I also understand that you cannot keep six year olds socially distanced uh, the entire time, so that's why that mask requirement is in there. 
Any further discussion? Can we get the motion repeated, please? Sorry, I didn't hear you, Ms. Park. Should let the motion repeat it. Repeat the motion? Yes. Yes. Would you like to yes. It would read, players shall come to the rink dressed to play. Team rooms will be open to players, coaches, and other adult help all persons. All people entering the team room must wear masks at all times and maintain six feet of distance when possible. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the roll on the motion. Councilmember Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? No. Ruffridge? No. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carrie? No. Student Representative Cox? No. You have three yes votes and three no votes. You did it to me again. Uh, I will vote no. Motion fails three to four. Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess I just want to. Um, we uh, put a motion on the floor uh, to adopt uh, or to discuss um, bringing back the uh, sports center rules and uh, regulations adopted at our September 9th uh, council meeting and the discussion that ensued for that. Um, maybe that would be a question for the the clerk if that uh, needs further clarification or uh, if we need to have that as a document that we can look at, but um, that would be something I would move. The record from that is available on the website. I, that would be a decision of the council if they wanted to view that previously uh, approved policy before making an, any further additional changes, which if we took a recess, I could definitely email it and post it on the web, but it would take me a little while. I have it. I can email it. If we take a recess, I can put it on the website for the public to view as well so they are aware of what's being discussed. Thank you. Any other discussion? I guess it would need a second. Oh. Yes. Do we have a second for that one? Well, I second. Thank you, Ms. Hutchings. Some discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Rufford. Um Well, I, I feel uh, pretty strongly that we did a, a lot of good work as a group um, back in September, and we had combined with the administration. I think uh, the efforts that the administration is making in communication with the hockey groups is maybe a step beyond uh, what we were doing with the mitigation plan that was in place that adds to the ability uh, to open up the sports center safely. Uh, the plan that we had in place was a strict one back in September, but it allowed for access to the sports center uh, and attempting to do things safely. Uh, I, I do think that uh, the addition of uh, potentially some mass uh, requirements for everyone that's not on the ice would maybe be a good addition uh, to the previous uh, iteration of our mitigation plan. Uh, but barring, you know, the significant increase in cases um, and the governor's order, um, our, our mitigation plan, I, I had a sense, was working well uh, for, the, for the public and for the people that were accessing and using the sports center. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there didn't seem to be any reports of large uh, spreading events uh, occurring uh, within that, that group. Um, I just want to uh, start that discussion and see if that, that might be the the will and wishes of the council, uh, so appreciate consideration of that. Yeah, just for a clarification, uh, 
that uh, September 9th policy you were discussing, that was the same one we had we had in effect at the time we closed it in November? That'd be a question to Ms. Queen. Sure, Mr. Mayor. I'd be happy to summarize if that's helpful for the council. Um, so when we uh, were open and, and people were skating back in October, a couple main differences between what we were doing back then and what we proposed for this meeting. But um, essentially back then, masks were not required for anyone in the facility. So uh, we have not yet had any conversations about having on-ice masks. And really, in terms of spectators and people within the facility, it was still just a recommendation for folks entering that facility, but it wasn't a requirement. Um, games were allowed, so there was no restriction on um, on ice social distancing, limiting um, contact drills or, or gameplay. Really, it was open to practices or games. We had originally proposed a spectator limit of 40 people, um, but then we had administratively increased that to 80. Uh, Andrew had uh, in the weeks that we, after we started opening the ring, so we were at an 80 spectator limit. Um, and we were, at that point, doing public skating and allowing 40 people on the ice for public skate. Um, that's different than what we're proposing right now. We weren't proposing to open up public skate at this time. The team rooms originally, uh, when we proposed it back in September, were to be closed. Uh, but as I mentioned, at some point we did open them back up, and I think that's when we went through that process with the state organization of getting that review. We did end up opening them, but our original recommendation back in September was that they be closed. Um, and then, as Mr. Reppridge pointed out, really we didn't have any expectations in terms of the user groups having folks on site to help with either enforcement, education, uh, that really wasn't a piece of the plan. I know that one of the organizations has been doing that anyway, they've been doing their own health screenings and checks, but, but that's a difference from what we're um, proposing to lay out moving forward. And then there were a lot of things that were the same. So the touch point cleaning uh, with the hydrostatic cleaners that Andrew has, we would still continue to do that, still encourage people to bring water bottles and use the water bottle filling stations, um, still trying to work with the 15 minutes before ice time and the 15 minutes after ice time. That was consistent between what we were doing before and what we're proposing now. And the on-ice limits are actually about the same as well. So back then we were seeing 40 on the rink on the ice at a time for hockey. Um, and if you look at our current proposal, we actually increased it to 44 for the younger skaters, um, but proposing it be reduced to 32 for all other hockey. So those are a little bit different, but fairly similar. Um, and those are the main main differences. So really, masking, masking is fairly different with this new proposal, as well as whether to allow games versus practices only. Thanks. So would it be... A better wording if it was uh, saying that go back to the policy that was in effect at the time of closing? If I may, Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Carmichael. I, I do know that KPHA is requiring their spectators to wear masks. So that, that direction has been started, just not at this, the city level. Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, it would be the intention, I think, uh, for me, just to state that um, now, that the uh, to use the September uh, or the, the policy that was in place at the time of the sports center closing as a foundation and then uh, discuss maybe making some amendments to that to add in some of these pieces that it seems that the council has agreement on might be useful uh, for reopening. Would the second agree to that? Uh, actually, no. Okay, so the motion on the floor, Mr. Joseph. Um, I guess I would just have some concerns about bringing back a motion to roll back to the September uh, operating framework. Um, just given how broad that is, it really comes down to just cleaning guidance and recommendations for participation at the facility. The big ones for me are the, the, the games and the houses. Um, I know that our, our staff has done a lot of research in preparing a mitigation plan that's before us. It's, it's in line with the current risk levels. It's in line with what other governments are doing. 
um, I, I would feel more comfortable starting with that as our baseline, and let's amend that to make that a little bit more um, expansive and inclusive of what our community would like, um, and open that up rather than starting with the floodgates completely open and trying to kind of patch that up uh, as we go. Um, so I, I would not be supporting that. Let's let's expand the one that we have before us. Let's have a lot of research put into it. Any other discussion? Vice Mayor Parker. So we have we have a motion on the floor at this time. Is that correct? We do. We do have a motion. Mr. Ruffridge's motion was to go back to the September 9th uh, policy or Vice Mayor Parker. Sorry, I would like to call for the question. Requires a second, not debatable. Yeah, we require a second. Mr. Joseph? Oh, I was going to comment. I wasn't seconding the motion called the question. Okay. Do we have a second for the Mr. Carey? Second. Okay. No discussion. Mm -hmm. Call for the vote. Councilmember Chilson? Uh, point of order, the vote is to, we're voting to call the question right now. If, if that vote fails, we can still comment. Is that correct? That is correct. Councilmember Chilson? No. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carey? Yes. Representative Cox? Yes. You have five so, yes votes. Calling for the question passed uh, five to one. Now the main motion is on the floor. Call for the roll. So, Councilmember Chilson? No. Lisa Parker? No. Hutchings? No. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? No. Carey? No. Student Representative Cox? Student Representative Cox? No. You have five no votes and one yes vote. A motion failed one to five. Any more discussion on this item? Did you have your hand raised, Mr. Chisel? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what I'd say is I, I am supportive of what Councilman Ruffridge is trying to get to. I just not, not the mechanics of doing it. I, I just wanted to clarify that I would like to see where we have right now before us as a starting framework, and let's let's amend that, try to broaden that up, and figure out how we can expand access, but do it safely and get that closer. I just rather start this side and work towards the middle than work start the other side and work towards the middle. That's all. Vice Mayor Parker. Oh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, I would make a motion that the council direct the administration to reopen the rank for limited use as delineated in the December 16 memo as amended. As amended? As amended. Would be Is amended. there a second? Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Hutchings. Discussion? Ms. Vice Mayor Parker. Um, thank you. Um, this would provide the administration with direction on how to proceed moving forward with getting the rink back open, um, with allowing parents to bring their kiddos and their other family members in, maintaining the social distancing, wearing the mask while both in the facility and on the rink, um, and we'll get the kids back out, back out on the ice, and then for actual hockey games, getting the games back at, at Arc Lake and getting some lighting out there so we can get some 
some things going on out there, but this would provide the administration with direction and knowing our city manager and our parks and rec director, I know when it comes to doing the, the sanitizing and making sure that the facility is going to be safe between transition, transition from one team to the next, that they will be doing that and looking back at the mitigation plan that was adopted back in September and using the guidance from that going forward. Any further discussion? Ms. Pamela Parker. I have a question for Mr. Carmichael um, or just anyone with more hockey knowledge than I have. Are kids under a certain age required to have face shields, like the plastic face shields on their helmets when they play, or is that only a school specific rule, or is that a hockey wide thing? Because in my mind, a, a plastic face covering over their over their helmet would count as a facial covering. If I'm sorry, but I would defer to you. All all players must wear a cage or a shield up until age 18. After 18, they can go to a half shield or um, even less. Some so, are plastic shield. Some have the cages, the masks. If, if there was a plastic shield, they are more confining or closed in than a cage, but still very area. Um, whereas a cage would definitely be, the inserts would definitely um, significantly reduce that. Okay. Um, so just, I guess, a question for discussion. If the council's intent is to have everyone on the ice still uh, wearing some sort of facial covering, would the helmet with the shield be sufficient in lieu of the helmet with the face guard and a mask either underneath or on top of it? Would that be something that there would be interest in making that exception in this policy? Or is the intent still to, to have masks on the ice as well as the helmets. Can Mr. Carmichael or Ms. Queen answer that? Ms. Queen? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, um, Andrew and I talked about this. We did another review of the CDC guidelines, and they specifically, um, they don't address hockey face masks, but they do address face shields and goggles in general, and specifically identify that um, because those are intended primarily to protect the person's eyes who's wearing it, that they don't qualify as a face covering when they're making recommendations about masks. So um, I would think that the plastic face shields that you can see are fairly similar to the face shields that are on hockey masks and that um, it likely wouldn't comply with the guidelines that we were trying to put in place according to the CDC. Mr. Carey? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a procedural issue. If this was passed, would it negate any of the three motions, three decisions we've already made here tonight. So, if this was a yes, would uh, yeah, would either would it overturn votes that we did in the last half hour? Vice Mayor Parker. And thank you, Mayor Carey, uh, Councilmember or Mayor Whitten, Councilmember Carey. Now, my intent was that this would the motions that were adopted and changed would be part of this motion. So it would still require the masks, it, it would uh, blend the incorporation of two and three, it would not allow for team rooms to be reopened. So. Okay. Thank you very much. That's what I need to know. Thank okay. you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions or discussion from the council? Seeing none, the call for the roll. Councilmember Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? No. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Student Representative Cox? Yes. You have five yes votes and one no vote. Uh, the motion passed five to one. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll move on to K-12. 
CARES Act spending plan update and discussion. Report from the administration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have that with me because it was a late add-on to the packet, so it didn't print in front of me. Can I have requested two minute eddies and I'll go get a copy of that? That would be acceptable. Okay, we'll take a short, short break here for five minutes. We'll be back on at 7.50. Ms. Queen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I apologize for that delay. Um, so as you know, we've been working really the second half of this year on uh, distributing CARES Act funding, the federal dollars that were provided to the city through the state of Alaska and also through the connections to the borough to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And the council has several times seen a version of this spending plan where we have been updating it as we go and allocating the funding into different categories. Um, what we presented last week is essentially our assessment of where we're at right now, our best guess of where we're at uh, right now through the end of the year. And our finance director has added some columns that you haven't seen before in previous versions of this to let you know um, what expenses have actually been paid through November. Uh, those, are, those are expenses that we've built to the grant that we've already reported to the state of Alaska. The next column is expenses paid this month to date, have not yet been reported, but we've already incurred that. And then the next column is our projected expenditures. So when we look at all of that, um, essentially what we end up with is an unallocated grant amount we're projecting at about 850000 And that's 850000 out of the, the $9.9 uh, million that we received both through the state and the borough. And there will continue to be um, accounting and adjustments as true costs are known. And, um, so these numbers will change, but that's our best assessment as we close out projects, um, grant programs of, of where we're at right now. Um, so really the, the goal in bringing this to you today, although our options are fairly narrow at this point in terms of what we might be able to do, we do have some options left to us. And my goal is to get a sense from the council whether you want us to focus on any one uh, particular priority. Um, these grant funds can only be used through uh, eligible expenses through December 30th. And so the most likely uh, use of additional funds from our perspective would be to revisit grant programs that we've already issued. So in talking with Mr. Zarneski, in talking with Ms. Reiner, uh, and our, our finance director, we have an opportunity to go back and, for example, look at the phase two business grants that we gave and decide if we were to adjust the cap for those criteria, we could redistribute additional funds to businesses by revisiting that most recent phase of business grants. And the same would be true for nonprofits. We're um, continually engaging with the six or seven nonprofits that have received grants from the city whether it be the food bank, uh, PCHS, Loving, the college. There's additional opportunities for us to amend those individual grant agreements as well if they can find additional uh, eligible expenses. Those really, I think, are our um, most realistic and achievable opportunities of getting this additional funding out into the community. Um, anything that would require us to purchase new things. So if we had you know, a nonprofit, for example, that wanted to acquire new things, those will be really challenging because they'll have to have those items and those goods on hand by December 30th. Um, so it, we have not given up on those uh, types of ideas yet, but I do want to stress the, the timeline is very narrow at this point to be entertaining new projects. Um, really, I wanted to, to just present this update to members of the council, get some feedback, and if you have ideas, we're happy to have um, your input and a discussion about what we might be able to do between now and, and the end of this grant opportunity. Um, I will say one more note about the timeline. Although the grants can only be used for uh, expenses that were incurred through December 30th, we do have an opportunity to work into the new year, into January, and still be administering these funds, still be making some decisions. Because the December grant reporting is actually due one month later. So really, all of January, we will have not yet filed the December report, and we can still be looking at opportunities to fund things as long as they were only through that December 30th period. So we have a little bit of time, small amount of time, um, to spend uh, these additional $850,000 in grant funds 
the only one caveat is not knowing yet whether Congress will pass an additional relief bill and whether an extension of this first round of care back funds would be incorporated into that legislation. Um, I did email uh, to Senator Murkowski's office today to see if uh, we could get a sense of whether there might be an extension of these funds incorporated into uh, a new relief bill if it gets negotiated. And at this time, uh, there are many municipalities hoping for that and advocating for that, but no, not yet a sense of whether that's realistic. So that's the only other caveat is that it may be <coughs> that this deadline is extended. We just don't know that yet. And so we're trying to put the city in position to make the best use of these funds in either scenario. There are any questions from the council? Mr. Carey. Thank you. A couple. Um, did previous grants already given, did, was there anything given to uh, or for homelessness? Uh, thank you, Mr. Carey, for that question. Yes, we had um, primarily worked through the organization Love Inc. Um, as they're kind of a, a resource and a go to for folks experiencing homelessness. And I believe they received. Um, one of our phase one um, nonprofit grants, as well as um, a more recent grant specifically to um, put together homeless prevention um, supplies. So essentially a, a cold weather shelter kit where they would have supplies that then could be deployed to different locations. So homelessness, and uh, it was one of our key priorities early on, um, working with Love Inc. was the avenue which, through which we explored that. Good, thank you. And, and you answered my second one, which was to deal with the cold shelter. So I'm hearing you say that some of the funds with the Love Inc. would be used in that effort. That is correct. The funds that they uh, used were to buy the supplies um, and, a, and a trailer, I believe, to house those supplies so that they could be deployed to different locations. It wasn't uh, that the funds were associated with a specific location. Okay. Thank you. Then just the last thing, uh, just... Uh, Suggestion. Whatever we can do to help small businesses in our town, we need to. There are many that are very sure they're not going to be able to open if there aren't changes. And so that, from my standpoint, having dealt with homeless and uh, the cold shelter, um, my highest priority would be the small businesses in this community to get out every single penny we can to them. Thank you. Any other comments from the council? Vice Mayor Parker. Thank, thank you, Mary Whitney. And I want to commend the administration for the work that they have done over the last uh, five months as they've been distributing this CARES Act money to get oh, almost $9 million into the community um, in that short period of time. You, you have to be applauded, and, and I applaud you and your team for the work that you guys have done. Um, as, as Mayor, or former Mayor Kerry, Council Member Kerry mentioned, um, my preference would be to direct it back to the business grants and to other nonprofits that we've already worked with. Um, you've, got, you've got a process in place, you know the folks that you're working with. Um, I think if there were new organizations that popped up, they would have popped up before. And so focus focus on those areas right now as, as you recommended it would be my recommendation. And again, thank you very much for your work. Ms. Hutchings. Yes, I just wanted to comment that we've been working closely with uh, the food bank. And I don't know if you realize the money that you have given the food bank has been in incredible for what they've done and they do 900 boxes of food a week that they distribute so that is a lot and you know when you think of I know we've got what two weeks two and a half weeks left in this in this year it would be a, a blessing for them to get some more funds to to accomplish that because they have two big reaper trucks that are running the highway every week to Anchorage picking up foodstuffs. And the other one, of course, people are sometimes forget about domestic violence, and it is uh, quite prevalent during this COVID time, and during the winter, and during the holidays. So it, something could be given to Lee Shore or to hospice as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, 
I agree with the what uh, the other council members uh, have talked about that uh, to get it, as much funds back out to the small business, uh, the uh, nonprofits, and any other group that uh, can help the members of our community. So, does that give you enough uh, direction, Ms. Queen? It certainly does. Um, thank you to the council for um, your support and the decision making and, and putting these programs um, out in the community. And we will follow through in that vein with an update at your next um, meetings, as well as this is just a teaser, but we've got a really nice infographic we're preparing with where all the grant funds have gone, how many individuals, how many businesses, how many nonprofits. And so we'll be able to update this when we get some additional numbers. Um, as we go. So thank you for that direction. We'll keep working on it and we'll keep you posted. Ms. Hutchings? Yes, I did want to comment that the shop uh, local was an incredible program that you worked with with the chamber. And I would love to see that extended um, to where, because people were so excited that they could do this. They And they felt like they were giving back to the community as well. So I think that was a great program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could just give one quick update on that. I know that program closed today. Originally, um, the city council had approved $100,000 for those vouchers. Um, early on, we knew that they were going to far surpass that, and so we approved an additional $100,000. Um, they far surpassed that. So we, uh, John Zornes, who's been in really constant communication with Shannon over the chamber, and told her, just keep going, keep going for the whole grant period. Um, and as of today, I think they gave out almost almost three hundred thousand dollars in those coupons, meaning um, almost three thousand households participated in turning in their receipts and getting those those shop local coupons. So um, kudos to John and to Laura on our team, but really to the chamber for their really stellar administration of that program. Yes, that was a great program. I got my vouchers, and I went out and bought books. Vice Mayor Parker. So, if I might, Mayor Whitney, so, City Manager, you said that 300000 in coupons, so um, that means $900,000 is being spent locally with businesses during this month and a half period? Uh, thank you, Ms. Parker. So, I exaggerated a little bit, but I think it was about 288000 was the update today. So, you're correct. So times that amount um, would Close have been, right, almost three times, including the coupon, so quite a bit. Our goal originally was to generate, to stimulate several hundred thousand dollars in spending, and as I mentioned, we, we exceeded that by a multiple of almost three. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, next item on the agenda is Mayor Council reports. Uh, I have written a letter to, uh, I think it was rural, something or other, for uh, supporting the Kenai performers, uh, receiving a loan to purchase a building so they could continue on in their operation. Um, I would ask the uh, administration to provide each of us a copy of the policy uh, at the sports center that was in effect when we closed it in November. Uh, that way everybody knows well, what was going on at that time and we can work from that. And then uh, the motion that we passed earlier on the Sports Center, uh, I know we want to get it open, we want to get kids back in their play, but I think that whole um, policy is going to be a little confusing to people. Um, I think it was confusing to us, and I think it's uh, going to be confusing to the, uh, the current users. So. And that is up, is all I have. We'll move on to the council reports and board commissions, uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting. Mr. Chilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll keep this fairly brief tonight. So the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, we did meet on December 11th, and just a couple highlights from that meeting. 
um, work has coming to a completion on the new visitor guide. It's been sent out to the uh, printers for production for the 2021 season. Um, as uh, previously mentioned, the shop local program has been a wild success. Uh, there's been tons of positive feedback from the local business community on that. Um, and moving forward, um, because uh, that has actually deferred a little bit of uh, focus in the uh, chamber on other projects they were previously working on, like websites, so they're going to be focusing on that moving forward in January. Uh, upcoming uh, events, we do have Soldatna Shines on December 18th. The uh, chamber is going to be partnering with KSR Radio Group. Uh, to put on a Christmas event at the Sports Center. There's going to be music, fireworks, of course, uh, social distancing, masking encouraged. Uh, and uh, I hear that Santa will be there as well. Um, financials are doing quite well this year, um, thanks to uh, assistance through CARES. Um, and then finally, they are starting preliminary planning for Sparks and Dotna for 2021. Um, which debuted last year it was a wild success uh, as far as getting uh, funding out there through business scholarships. That's all I have. Are there any questions for Mr. Chilson? Kenai River Special Management Area Meeting. Mr. Carmichael. I tell you, the, um, the, the last couple of meetings are mostly focused on the topic of evaluation and site identification for the uh, proposed Funny River Area Boat Launch. That is right up there with mask or no mask in terms of the sports center, in terms of different points of views and a lot of information, including the work session that I attended last night that was for public public comment and, and those type of things. So so it, it's a pretty substantial, there's been a site evaluation by members of the Charisma Board as well as locals in response there. And um, and it's, it's, it's exciting. It's not going to be fast, but it is something that's been needed for many years as a, a public access boat launch on that side. So the remainder of the, um, as just like us, the state and everybody else is fairly closed down with some work continuing over the winter and moving forward, but for the most part, that focus has been on the Piney River action. Any questions for Mr. Carmichael? Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, moving on to item nine on the agenda. City Manager's report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually don't have any additional information to report tonight. Thank you so much. Any questions for the City Manager? Seeing none, we'll move to item 10, public comments. Uh, members of the public will have three minutes to comment. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the, right, the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star 9 on your telephone. And Sorry, I, I see one hand raised at this for Tamara Miller. If you could please state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. My name is Tamara Miller, uh, 465-23 Blue Shadow Court, Soldatna. Um, I just want to start by saying that I didn't understand why public comment wasn't allowed during the discussion of the reopening of the sports center. Uh, it seems you would want to have direct input from those that are using the facility. I Just listening, it was obvious that the council members aren't really familiar with how a hockey program is run, um, and I felt like you would have benefited from allowing uh, those of us that use the facility regularly for the purpose of hockey um, to comment. But with that being said, I, I do really appreciate the efforts of trying to get the building open. Um, I do still have some serious concerns that I think you need to address. I think the U6 and U8, that means under 6 and under 8 age groups, should have been addressed separately when discussing wearing masks on the ice. Um, these kids have difficulty following direction, paying attention. The practices um, are typically just focused on steel building, keeping the kids moving throughout the 45 minutes to an hour that they're on there. There's usually anywhere from 25 to 35 or 40 kids to maybe 4 to 6 adults. Um, and I, I'm worried, you know, it's possible they may not be able to verbalize properly if they're having issues breathing. 
Um, and I think considering that the CDC has stated that young children are very low transmitters of COVID, that it would be actually safer to conduct practices in this age group without them wearing masks on the ice. <coughs> they obviously continue to wear masks off the ice. Um, Kenai Mental Hockey Association is requiring that, as well as the Alaska State Hockey Association. Um, so anybody coming into the building, um, child or adult, is um, told they must wear a mask. And um, so I, I really do think that is something you guys need to address. I'm not sure how soon it can be addressed, but um, it is a concern. Considering our sister city, Kenai, um, and other cities such as those in the valley um, are not requiring masks on the ice, I think it would have been more appropriate to mirror uh, those, those communities that are more like our community than trying to um, be like Anchorage. Um, but other than that, I just, uh, I do think that the games issue needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. We do have high school hockey starting as well. Um, and those are things that are going to come up very quickly. It would have been good if you guys could have looked at that tonight, just to allow parents and the people that are involved in these programs to plan properly. Um, but in the end, I do appreciate what you did. I do appreciate you getting the building open. Um, and opening the lines of communication between the hockey programs. We are committed to doing what we have to do to keep the kids on the ice throughout the season. Um, I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Are there any questions from the council? Thank you. I see a hand raised for Melissa. Please state your name and address mm -hmm. for the record. Yes, my name is Melissa Jardy, um, Post Office Box 1148 in Kenai, Alaska. I'm calling in regards to the Sports Center reopening as I'm a parent to two littles of the KPHA program. Um, the whole hockey community would love to see the Salon Sports Center reopen. Thank you for um, addressing that and making the changes that you have. But we ask that the council members make adjustments especially to the mask mandate that Stephanie Queen and or Andrew Carmichael have stated. So the Kenai rink has remained open, but it doesn't require the players to wear the masks on the ice. <clears throat> Along with other rinks in Alaska, and I have reached out to six, and out of the six cities, only two are requiring masks. That's Anchorage and Juneau. Sorry. Um, it isn't healthy to force hockey players to wear masks on the ice. They're exerting themselves, they're listening to coaches, they're doing drills. One of my children wears glasses, and with the glasses, without the mask, it's hard to keep them defogged. And we've tried sprays and everything. He's got the clear shield that was suggested. The shield itself fogs up worse than the glasses do. As well as my younger one, who's in the U8 program, he uh, if you look around the community, look at how many adults visit with their masks while they're wearing them. Now imagine being a four to eight year old wearing those masks, trying to skate around, play hockey. They got a cage that's restricting them from moving it if the mask gets in their way. I think it would just be a huge distraction for what the kids are trying to do, which is learn the sport of hockey. Um, so in our association, we've been following all the ASK guidelines such as um, spectators wearing masks, coming to the rink dressed, entering and exiting within 15 minutes of your practice time. And we also ask that if your team is exposed or you have COVID, you let the president know. And in our association to this day, since our organization started up with hockey, we've had one positive COVID case since August. So, I mean, making masks required now in Soldatna would kind of be, why make that rule when we've already been doing good all along? Um, the rules were very confusing on what was changed. Um, just one thing that we would like to ask is that the masks be re-looked at. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions from the council? Ms. Pamela Parker. 
Thank you, Melissa. And just to clarify, when you're speaking about the masks being re-looked at, you just mean when players are on the ice, correct? You um, feel comfortable with folks wearing them while they're in the facility, but it's just once they're out on the ice, that's the, that's the concern? Yes, while on the ice. At the ranks, like Tammy had mentioned, KPHA does ask that all spectators wear masks. We've been adhering to it. We've been following it. The players come in with the masks until they get their helmet on. So if they could just take it off and be on the ice without it, most of us would be, would be willing to adhere to those policies. I know there are parents that are wanting to take their kids off the ice if masks are required. Thank you, Melissa. And I do have to apologize because the intent of my first motion was to do that exactly, to require masks in the facility, but have them uh, not be required on the ice. And I, I believe that I personally botched that motion, and it was a little confusing for council members, and I believe that's why it might not have passed. Uh, so I do apologize for that. I did uh, make an attempt to, to get that changed, and I'm hoping that in the future we can get that updated. Any other questions from the council? Seeing none, thank you for your comments. I do not see any other hands up. So we will end the public comments and move on to item 11, council comments. Uh, we'll start out with uh, student representative Quinn Cox. So with the sports center reopening, which before this meeting, uh, our our uh, Mr. Neal, our activities director, has been looking into hockey and basketball mitigation plans to get them started up with everything that's been going on. Um, luckily, skiing did start Monday, so we do have skiing that started. We've been doing practices. We started on Monday, so we've been doing it this week. They've been going well. We do have to wear masks the entire time. That is just one thing that we have to live with. Um, and then a few things that Studio is doing through the Christmas break is um, we partnered with the Elks with, for a toy drive, and I actually personally helped wrap gifts today. Um, we'll be getting them out. We already have most of them out. We'll be getting them out at the end of this week. And then, as a student, we also will be doing home visits to anyone, to any of the students, just to help with morale and I guess the spirits. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Vice Mayor Parker. Oh, thank, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, my only comments are with respect to um, athletic events. As you may have seen in the newspaper earlier this year, the University of Alaska Anchorage canceled basketball, volleyball, and hockey. And University of Alaska Fairbanks was allowing those sports to continue and this week um, the Chancellor in Fairbanks has also canceled all hockey, basketball, volleyball for this academic school year. So those are major events that occur within our university system that will resume, we hope, in the fall of 2021. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually don't have much in the way of comments except for uh, maybe, maybe a question actually about uh, your comments, Mr. Mayor, uh, for your section. You had uh, mentioned uh, asking the administration to send out the uh, September 9th uh, Sports Center uh, documents uh, to be looked at, and I guess I, I was a little confused by that comment given the fact that we had just voted on something different. And I, I guess. Uh, that was really my only comment, as I'm not sure what, what you were intending by that. What I asked is the uh, policy that that was in effect when we closed the sports center. So that we can look at that and see if we want to make adjustments 
at the next meeting to uh, open up the sports center even more. Carry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to start off again, uh, applaud the city. The Shop Slobodna program was wonderful. There were so many people. The, the reality is a lot of people couldn't believe it. They thought you were kind of pulling their leg or something. Go do this. Do this. No, no, come on. So I just want to say it was wonderful. I can't help but think that the businesses in Slobodna appreciate it. And it showed where our heart was, which was with them. The next one, and I don't know how to do this, and so I going to stumble a little bit, but I would like some type of input on the, when our schools would be back open. Um, you know, I'm kind of a community person, so when I see a bunch of people at the Y, the kids and everything else, for many hours with signs, uh, it makes me want to stop. And so it's getting about open our schools. Uh, and so uh, I'd be interested in some type of a update on what are the standards, again, what are the thresholds that have to be met. Um, we obviously know we have more schools in Sabata than any other uh, town, uh, and it would be very nice to know and to be able to respond to those people who are saying, uh, are you working to get our school back open? And the third thing, and this is probably the most serious, you know, I'm not very good on technology, but I was going through lots of stuff, and there's one place on this that says it will touch up your appearance. My computer program. I have hit the touch up appearance button repeatedly. And I'm still as ugly as I was before him. So I just want to say, if there's something wrong with my computer, I think that's a great thing to touch up parents, but mine doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carrick. Mr. Chelson. No comments. Sorry. Ms. Hutchings. Well, I have a few comments. And the first one is I want to apologize because at the last meeting, I disconnected when comments were going on because my computer died. I had absolutely no clue that our meeting was going to go four and a half hours, so I was not prepared. And the other thing I would like to say again, uh, the shop local was great. I had people from Kenai coming over and shopping in Soldat and said, why isn't Kenai doing this? And I said, well, you know, we're always just a little ahead of the curve. <laughs> and then for Mr. Carey, um, you might like to know that January 19th, I believe our schools are opening. Uh, as well as Anchorage schools. So that is what is on the, the calendar at this point, he, as long as our COVID numbers don't spike again after the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Thank you. And Miss Pamela Parker, I almost missed you. And I feel like I've spoken up. Um, Mr. Carey, you're beautiful. I don't know why you need to have your face adjusted in your camera. <laughs> That's my only comment. <laughs> Have a good night. Everyone. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is an executive session, uh, annexation, the local boundary commission, decisional hearing, city attorney Brooks Chandler, AS 44.62.310, parentheses C, parentheses 3. In accordance with Alaska statutes, the City Council may convene into an executive session to discuss matters which by law, municipal charter, or ordinance would be required to be confidential. May I have a motion, Vice Mayor Parker, to enter into an executive session? Uh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. I move to enter into executive session to discuss the Local Boundary Commission decisional hearing on the City of Sultana annexation petition with the city attorney. This executive session will include yourself, city council members, city attorney Brooks Chandler, the city manager, the economic development and planning director, and our public work director, along with our city clerk. I'll Is second there a second? That. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hutchins. Are there any objections to convening in the executive session? Seeing none, do we need a roll call vote? No. Okay. Uh, we will uh, suspend this uh, meeting for a short time and enter into executive session. For the public attending through Zoom, the meeting will remain open. However, the council will be leaving and we will return when we come out of executive session. Uh, 
May I have a motion to come out of executive session? I'll move to take us out of executive session. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. A second? I'll second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, any objection? Seeing no objection, we are out of exec executive session. Uh, next item on the agenda is meeting announcements. December 17, 2020, Airport Commission meeting at 5.30 p.m. January 6, 2021, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting at 5.30 p.m. And January 13, 2021, City Council meeting at 6 p.m. Seeing, uh, well, adjournment. Uh, next regular SEB meeting is January the 13th and uh, it's still on Webinar. Uh, I'm hoping we will be able to get out of that soon and start to have some face-to-face -face meetings again. So with no other business in front of us, we are adjourned. Merry Christmas, everyone.